And it's not just us that are getting excited here. We've got the institutional ownership ratio and we can see institutions are... Looks like a staircase here. Um, and it's showing you over time, regardless of Joby's share price, but moreover during the time that Joby has fallen, that institutional investors aren't just you know holding tight where they are, they're adding and continuously adding. So talking Joby Aviation here out of Santa Cruz, California with Travis. Great to have you back here on our channel and pulling up the first slide here, EV production companies of 2020 uh, from uh, Visual Capitalist. Two messages here. First, we don't see Joby's key partner, Toyota. Toyota completely missed the boat here. The largest or second largest manufacturer by total automotive production volume per year, Toyota not in the top 15 EV production 2022. The other interesting observation here is Chinese companies. There are currently 300 plus EV manufacturing companies in China. So there's only six companies out of China that made it into the top 50. And why is that relevant for Joby? We talk about market entry. We talk about the certification process with the FAA. So being first into the market is one thing, but then also maintaining leadership and maintaining long-term high market share with high profitability. Those are three very, very different <laughs> objectives. So Travis, you've done some amazing research on patents. What is Joby right, doing right now for that long-term leadership and profitability? Yeah, certainly in terms of the patent side, um, just you know, did some a deep dive of what is out there, and you know, if anybody who's interested to look through patent filings, they're not uh, again the most intriguing, um, but there there's a lot of good information in there, I guess I should say, uh, not not so exciting. So, the biggest thing that I took away was we found patents about the aircraft, about the you know app, whatever that if it ends up going through Uber or a Joby variant of the Uber app. Um, but that whole workflow, how the whole system works, there's a patent um, regarding that. Also in regards to Vertiport design, um, they're specifically from Joby. And then also uh, an interesting one, which I think is, is actually the, the exciting and fun one to hear about, um, just in terms of the, the engineering prowess and ways that Joby is, is really thinking, is the seat actually for the aircraft. Um, some really interesting little nuggets on that. So I think um, from that side, broadly, um, you can start to really see inside the, the factory, see inside the brain of the, the management and the de designers, the engineers, what, what, are, what are we looking at? Instead of just videos or you know, X posts, what is actually under the hood? Um, and some really, really interesting things um, you know, for the aircraft. There's also some other patents for other variants of the aircraft, um, which are also very interesting and, and exciting. I wouldn't put too much behind them because you know, a, a patent isn't uh, the end all be all, but it's just exciting to see that there's uh, a lot of things that um, Joby has in terms of you know, IP. And then, you know, moreover, as you said, building you know, a moat, if you must, as best they can around themselves to not just be the leader now, but be the leader you know, how, however uh, much time we have in terms of the runway for uh, EV tall and advanced air mobility. Yeah, so it looks like Joby is taking the Tesla approach here, designing a lot in-house, uh, which takes more capital, more time up front, but then gives you an edge uh, with the competition. Uh, you mentioned the mode uh, later on. The seat, load balancing, weight management, that's a big topic. I follow hans Werner Zimmermann one of the channels on YouTube about accidents in the residential private uh, aircraft space. And a lot of times not following rules on altitude here in the Alpine region in the mountains also has to do with weight, weight distribution and having too much weight uh, on board. So what has Joby planned regarding the weight load balancing? Yes, so for the seat, um, which it actually you know, also has a, a really cool look to it, almost a, you know, a Blade Runner Cybertruck almost styling. But what they've done with the weight management side is, is really fascinating. So a seat, typically, you know, a boring piece of structure, um, now has quite a few roles at the aircraft. So number one, the seat itself is going to now take the weight uh, and balance and do all the factoring for the pilots uh, at the time of departure. So typically you wouldn't be able to do that because you need to know how much fuel to then load, um, because as somebody know, weight and balance to an aircraft, you have to have the weight balanced across the aircraft as, as stated, because if not, 
you know, your flight, not management system, but everything won't work properly. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to turn, you're not gonna be able to maneuver, steer, um, gain altitude, lose altitude as you would wish. So now Joby's seats, when you sit down, are going to weigh all the passengers. There's a ballast system that will be under each seat to then be able to take care of the weight and balance. So if a passenger is too heavy, then they'll remove ballast from the seat. If the passenger's you know, too light, then they'll fill ballast into the seat. So really fascinating because that's gonna then speak to the aircraft in terms of getting um, passengers loaded before and after. Sometimes people aren't honest about their weight because all you can do, you can't, can't have a, a scale in the airport, right? So uh, these are things that are submitted by the passengers. So anyway, really exciting there. Moreover, that ballast can be anything. So they've, uh, it's even called out that it could be engine coolant, or excuse me, um, well, battery coolant, motor coolant. So what's already in the aircraft will just be used as that ballast, but also there uh, is the possibility to use fire suppression material. So in the event of an emergency or hard landing, that that could actually be a way to keep the cabin safe. And then again, along those lines, obviously we hope that there isn't ever an emergency, but we have to plan and have redundancy for, for it. Um, that ballast tank also, since there's fluid flowing through it and it's a closed system, can act as a hydraulic. So there's actually a component in the, that attaches to the back of the seat that if you were to have a hard landing, um, typically in a helicopter, that goes straight through the frame and into the passengers, and that doesn't feel too good, obviously, on your, your spine. Um, so this would just be, again, kind of a cushion, a shock absorber um, in the event of anything that would happen. So some really cool uh, things about the, uh, the patents there that, you know, again, saving weight, using, you know, clever engineering to be able to solve different things uh, for this aircraft is why it isn't just an electric helicopter. This is its own, um, you know, individual aircraft. and. Uh, Excited to see more. Important disclaimer at the, this point, take it with a pinch of salt. Joby will only have honest passengers, but it could be that some people are just a bit too optimistic about their weight. Over to you, Stein. Travis, the, Im the immediate thought I have when I hear a self-weighting system inside of an aircraft is that probably thanks to the system, less flights will actually go than where you have a system where you calculate with averages. What is your take on that? Sure, so you know, I think that is something that will be interesting to play out and if it, is really more of just a redundancy in terms of knowing exactly what the weights are versus, as you said, the average. And that's what we used to use for, uh, in the rotorcraft world, so 150 pounds was the average. So if you, know, if you typically had two to three passengers, that's what you would get. But, uh, you know, that, so I think, yes, to your point, it's not going to change anything per se, but it just adds another layer um, because, you know, you don't have to Google too far um, that there have been, you know, accidents, I think, you know, aren't referred to it, just where the thing was too heavy and they go to take off and, you know, kind of speaking to rotor wash and there's some other uh, technical dynamics of, of what that is to, when you take off. But after you get high enough where it becomes a problem, you could lose the throat, you know, essentially the floor would be pulled out from underneath you uh, if the aircraft was too heavy and that leads to bad things. You know, there's, there's high profile people that have unfortunately you know, had accidents even with that. So you can see, uh, you know, to that effect. But anyway, I, I think that'll be where it's more important is on the airing way on the side of caution than to change anything new or to um, prohibit the flow of traffic, as you mentioned. Talking about safety, you also found some interesting patterns on the VertiPort. So what has Joby planned there? Yes, so some, Interesting layouts that I think, you know, aren't completely anything new that we haven't seen if anybody looking in the space of vertiports, but um, they do plan to kind of restructure how, um, because of the amount of throughput that they plan to have with this aircraft, they're gonna need to cordon aircraft off for aircraft that are landing, aircraft that are charging or in service, and then aircraft that are departing. And so uh, what they've laid out is almost a, kind of a bullseye design. So instead of having your typical heliport or place where helicopter would land, those typical markings that are, are painted on um, or spray painted on, I guess, if you're in more you know, remote areas, this would be um, kind of a, an asphalt or you know, concrete uh, lighted grid underneath the floor. So as a pilot was flying in, you would see, let's say there's you know, six landing locations. Five of them would be red, in terms of a, as a visual from above from the pilots, one would be green, therefore knowing that that was the place to land. Now, if you really actually flesh it out of how would that work in reality, say you had more than one aircraft coming in to land, there'll have to be some other 
you know, number system or um, some other unique identifier that they'll be using. But it's, uh, it's just interesting to see that they are planning to be able to have kind of a constant flow of traffic as opposed to currently at a heliport or um, even an airport for, for landings. They have to be pretty spaced out uh, because obviously things could go wrong if uh, aircraft get too close unless they're not moving and on the ground next to each other. Yeah, and talking about Vertiport, there's been uh, some good news with the uh, partnership uh, Joby and Nomura, but also Joby, a new partnership on charging. So, Travis, what are the details there? Certainly, so uh, in terms of you know the real estate uh, over, I'm on that side of things over there in Asia, I, I think it's really important because obviously you've talked to, you know, the, the reason why you got interested in this was, um, you know, emergency situation. Somebody couldn't get you know, to a building in dense areas. I think obviously having a real estate partner, you don't have to buy real estate's going to be expensive. And so if you can somehow lease the space or they just want profit sharing of landing fees or whatever you know, unique structure that that business will work out, um, I think it's very you know, exciting for that market. And hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about that in 2024. Also that urban challenge there, uh, there in Korea will be I think another uh, jumping off point for us to, uh, to touch base. And then in terms of charging here in Southern California, so Joby partnered with Clay Lacey at uh, Aviation at the uh, John Wayne Airport, SNA. And I think, uh, you know, that partnership for me personally, just because I'm here uh, in Los Angeles is really exciting, but also just goes to show you that, again, just like we talked earlier, the importance maybe of, you know, not just the aircraft, but pilots are going to be a huge piece of it. Um, the other piece is going to be, can you fly these things from A to B and then charge them at either side so that they can fly back home. Um, and, and as we see this charger at Clay Lacey, there's a, a quite a bit of private air traffic, charter traffic uh, out of that airport and services Orange County. So um, that's gonna be, uh, you know, hopefully a, a hotbed for, you know, Joby to start out here in Southern California, I believe. My guess would be there's, that connector will be to somewhere near LAX um, and then maybe something in, in downtown area uh, and then potentially Santa Monica. Um, west side. So yeah, the, the, the commercial case is slowly being built, but um, having that charger in place um, is, uh, is really exciting because that'll be our second charger. The first one is at Edwards with the military at DOD. And so this will be the uh, second charger that isn't at the marina facility uh, from Joby. Great to see that Joby is doing uh, the right thing for fast market entry and securing market entry as one of the first, and then also building the long-term advantage of uh, sustaining that leadership. And it's not just us that are getting excited here. Um, we've got the institutional ownership ratio and we can see institutions are increasing their position in Joby. Yes, I, I mean, this uh, This is a chart that I've leaned on for you know the last little bit of time. Um, you know, again, something that we have to take with a bit of a grain of salt. Always you know, have to do our own you know, due diligence on things and, and can't always trust them, you know, the, the largest investors but it does give you some threshold of, you know, if a, a, lo a lot of entities that are quite sophisticated are not just holding a large position that, but are continuously following this. I mean, it, it looks like a staircase here um, and it's showing you over time, regardless of Joby's share price, but moreover during the time that Joby has fallen, that institutional investors aren't just, you know, holding tight where they are, they're adding and continuously adding. So, you know, again, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see this staircase continue, but um, again, a, a great sign for uh, re kind of regardless of what the macro economic picture is, whatever Joby's day-to-day -day stock price is, as we varied, you know, between high sixes, um, you know, and kind of high fives, that uh, the people who are paying attention and, and betting big money are also very excited about Joby. Okay, so uh, wrapping up this session, it is going to be a very challenging and dynamic market. Um, we are optimistic from what we are seeing that Joby is set to be one of the first to enter that market and then also secure the leadership profitable long term. Toyota not being here on the top 15, um, we hope that Toyota will put a lot of skin, even more than they're already doing right now, into the Joby game, so that Toyota having missed the boat on EV, that Toyota will seek in some form of cooperation, whether that's smart manufacturing or in any other flavor, to be one of the leaders in the EV tow space together with Joby. Thank you, Travis, for taking the time. And I look forward to our next discussion because we all have had a look at the Delta Joby contracts 
and the commitment from Delta to facilitate a thousand passengers per day and what that means. We'll discuss that in the next session, Travis. Best regards to California.